Take your Bibles, turn over to Philippians chapter 4. We're continuing our series on living by the promises of God. I want to ask you a few questions as we get started this morning. Are you experiencing any unmet needs in your life today? Now think about for a moment. Are there any bills that you cannot pay? Maybe a house payment that you cannot make. Are you experiencing any emotional unmet needs this morning? Maybe you're lonely. Perhaps you're broken down with grief. Maybe you're discouraged or disappointed. Are there any spiritual unmet needs that you have this morning? Maybe for forgiveness. Maybe for strength to keep going. You just feel like you cannot keep going. Maybe you're agitated and you need peace in your life. Are there any unmet needs in your life today? If there are, then you particularly need to hear this promise from God, that He will supply all of our needs. In Philippians chapter 4, we find this promise. We'll be reading verses 15 through 20. Stand in respect for the Word of God as I read. Paul writing to the church at Philippi. Paul is in prison at this time in Rome. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. For even in Thessalonica you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever, Amen. You may be seated. Here we clearly see that God promises to supply all of our needs. So if you are experiencing an unmet need in your life today, then we have a problem. Either God is not able to keep His promise, or You're not fulfilling the conditions of this promise so that God will meet your unmet needs. Now, I'm certain that the problem is not on God's side. And so if you're experiencing an unmet need this morning, then there must be some conditions of this promise that you are not meeting. Now today we're going to first look at the promise and seek to understand it. And then we're going to look at the conditions that we must meet for this promise to be a reality in our lives. And then we're going to look very clearly on how we can claim this promise that God will always meet our needs. Now the key truth you need to remember is this. God has promised to supply all of our needs when we meet His conditions. Over in verse 19, let's just take this promise and open it up. First he says, My God will supply all of your needs. Now God never promised to meet the needs of unbelievers. Now sometimes, many times, He mercifully does meet some of their needs. He gives them air to breathe. He gives them rain. He gives them sunshine. So God does mercifully meet the needs of unbelievers, but He has never promised to meet all of their needs. 
Second, when Paul says, my God, he's talking about the God of Scripture. He's talking about the creator God of the universe. He's talking about Yahweh, the God of Israel. He's talking about the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And since a promise is no better than the one who makes it, because it is the Lord God Himself who's making this promise, we can count on it as being absolutely secure. Next, he says, my God will supply all of your needs. Now, the word supply means to fill completely. It means to fulfill. It means to bring to completion. It means to a supply abundantly. In fact, look in verse 18. It's the exact same word that's translated amply supplied in verse 18. So we can say, my God will amply supply all of your needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And so we know that God has promised to amply supply, but another key word is the word needs. God has never promised to supply our wants. He's never promised to supply our desires or our wishes. He has promised to meet our needs. Now we use this word need very loosely in our English language. We'll say something like, you know, I need a new car. Oh, you do? Is the one you have broken down and it can't be fixed? No, but it's 10 years old. I need a new car. Well, you're not really needing a new car. What you're saying is, I would like, I want a new car. Your teenager comes to you and says, I need a new pair of shoes. And you say, well, what's wrong with the ones you got? Are they worn out? They got holes in them? Oh, no, but they're out of style. I need to get the same shoes that everybody else has. No, they don't need that. What they're saying is, I want a new pair of shoes. So if you are experiencing an unmet need in your life, the first thing you must do is determine, is this really a need or is it just a want? Is it really something I have need of in order to live and serve and glorify God? Is it a necessity or is it something I just would like to have? An iPad is not a necessity. A 60-inch LCD TV, men, is not a need. It is a want. And so we need to be honest, and we need to say, is this thing a legitimate need? Because if it is, God has promised, if we will meet His conditions, that He will amply supply that need. He also says, according to to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now I want you to look at the phrase, according to. Now this word in the Greek doesn't mean God will supply out of His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. That would be like God is, say, a billionaire, and you need a $1,000, and so he just takes $1,000 out of his billion and gives it to you. That would be out of. But this word is according to, in the character of, in proportion to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So what does that mean? That means like God's a billionaire and you need $1,000, he gives you 5000 or he gives you 10,000. Why? Because it is a character of His generosity to do so. And so God has promised to amply supply our needs according to, in keeping with His gracious, merciful, loving nature. And that's a whole lot better than out of His abundance. But according to His abundance. Now, we see many examples of this in the New Testament in the life of Jesus. Let me just give you some examples. 
You remember when there were the 5,000 men and probably the time you added children and, and women, there were 25,000 people that needed food? Remember that? So Jesus took some fish and some loaves of bread and he multiplied it and he fed everyone. And the scripture says they were all satisfied. I think that was probably the first buffet in history, right? They all ate, were satisfied, and there were 12 baskets full left over. Now, there are two different words in the Greek for basket. One of them is kind of like a, a basket you might carry it to put some flowers in. The other word is a big 50-gallon basket, like a trash can, that a man can get down inside of. In fact, it was when Paul had to escape from Damascus and they lowered him over the wall in a basket, this is the word used. So when there were 12 basketfuls left over, it wasn't a little bitty basket, it was those big 50-gallon or larger baskets that were filled up with food. God didn't just supply what was needed and no more. He amply supplied. Another occasion, Jesus fed 4,000 people. And the scripture says, again, they all ate, they were satisfied, and there were seven full baskets left over after that. You remember when Peter had been out fishing all night? He had caught nothing. Jesus said, Peter, go out, put down your net for a catch. Now, Peter put down his net. Did he catch four fish, five fish, ten fish, twenty fish? No, it was so much he couldn't haul it all in. He had to get people to help him carry the net full of fish into the boat. Jesus didn't just supply what he needed. He supplied much more than he needed. Two boats full. He also amply supplied their emotional needs. You remember disciples wanted to see a Galilee and there was a storm brewing and they saw this figure walking and they thought it was a ghost and they were tremendously terrified and Jesus said, hey guys, it's me. You don't need to be afraid. And he gave them his peace. Much more than simply what was needed. The woman caught in adultery, embarrassed, shamed, guilt. Jesus goes to her and says, Woman, who are those who condemn you? Then neither do, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He showed that woman love, compassion, gentleness, forgiveness. Supplied much more than simply what she needed. He supplies our spiritual needs. You remember Nicodemus? A great teacher of the law. The scripture indicates he was the premier teacher in Israel at that time. And yet he comes to Jesus and he doesn't understand that Jesus said you must be born again. And he says, I don't, how, can, how can that happen? And Jesus talks about spiritual birth. And Nicodemus comes into the saving truth of the gospel. Zacch Zacchaeus up in that tree, that tax collector that needed the forgiveness of his sins. He needed his old heart of thievery turned to an honest heart and Jesus saved him and changed him and he gave five times as much as he took. The woman at the well, embarrassed, living in sin, Jesus comes and says, I'm going to give you water that if you'll drink of this water, you will never thirst again. He gave her much more than what she needed. But you see, Paul says, my God, will amply supply your needs, all your needs, according to his riches in glory in Christ. Now let's look at the conditions in order to have this promise fulfilled. There are certain conditions we must meet. It is not an unconditional promise. And you might say, well, preacher, how do you gather that from verse 19? Well, I gathered, first of all, from the context of the verse. It's in the context of giving to missionary causes that this promise comes. So that's the first way I know there are some conditions. The second way I know there are conditions is from all the other verses in Scripture that put conditions on God supplying our needs. This is why you never take just one verse 
and try to build a system of theology or a th- biblical principle on just one verse. You've got to take the whole Bible and what the Bible teaches on that subject. Here, the first condition is we are giving to Christian ministries. Paul is talking to the church at Philippi. He says to them that they have met his needs. God has used them to meet his needs on more than one occasion. That they have given up an offering. They have taken it to him while he has been in prison. Sometimes they were the only church that was helping him. He says in verse 16, For even in Thessalonica you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Same word that's used in verse 19. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my need. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek the profit, which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full, having an abundance, and am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Paul says, look, you know, I don't want you to think that I'm just after your gifts. I'm not. God has used your gifts to meet my needs, and he's going to meet your needs accordingly as well. But I am more excited about the credit that goes to your account. When we give to Christian causes, to ministries, churches, missionaries, what they do in in their ministry, in their service, God credits some of that to our account. When we get to heaven, we're going to get some rewards from the service they have done because we help support them in their ministry. That's what Paul's talking about. He said, that's what I'm excited about. And I have received amply supplied by what you gave. And you can be sure my God is going to keep and amply supply your needs as well. So first, giving to Christian causes, Christian ministries, giving to the church, giving to missionaries. Second condition is we must seek first God in our life. Seek God first in our life. Jesus is talking about worrying in Matthew 6, and he's talking about worrying about you won't have enough food, worrying you won't have enough clothes, all these things. He says, look, even unbelievers worry about those things. So he says, do not worry then saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles, unbelievers, eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you... What's that word? Need all these things. God knows your needs. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The condition for God meeting your needs is seek Him first. Are you seeking God and His glory? Above all things. That means that you are absorbed in a search for, you use your strenuous effort to obtain His glory, to seek His kingdom, to seek His righteousness. That word seek was used of a merchant who was looking, searching for that great pearl, that pearl of great price. And once he finds it, he sells everything he has to buy that pearl. That's the same word used. And Jesus said, Seek first God's kingdom. Is God the number one priority in your life? Now to help you answer that, think about how much time you spend with Him in prayer and in the study of His Word. Now if you only spend 10 minutes a week in prayer and in His Word, it's going to be hard to convince yourself or anybody else that He's the first priority of your life. How much time do you spend serving Him, working in His kingdom work? Are you seeking to obey God above everything else? Are you half-heartedly seeking Him 
given him the leftovers of your time, the leftovers of your energy, the leftovers of your income. Well, if, if at the end of the month when we paid all the bills, if we have anything left over, we'll give that. Some people say, well, preach, I just can't afford to give. No, you cannot afford not to give. If you want needs met, you need to be giving to God, seeking His kingdom first. So if you're experiencing an unmet need, you need to ask yourself, am I giving faithfully first? Then you need to ask yourself, is God really first in my life? Is he the top priority in my life? Third condition is we need to follow Jesus as our Lord. Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples about giving up and, and surrendering everything and giving up everything and following him. And so Peter jumps in and Peter began to say to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who's left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in this present age. And look at this. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms along with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. So have you surrendered all to follow Jesus as your Lord? Forsaken all for Him? That's a condition. That doesn't mean you're going to be a preacher. God doesn't call everybody to be a preacher. That doesn't mean you're going to be a missionary in some of the darkest regions of South America. No. But it means that you will be working in the job God wants you to work, and in the job you're working in, you'll seek to serve and glorify God in that job. That that job will not be an end in itself, but only a means to help you serve God in your life, to help you support ministries. That's what we're saying. Have you totally surrendered your will to His will? Have you committed all your possessions to Him? Lord, I'm just a steward. I'm just here to manage what you have provided. It's yours. It's not mine. It's yours. God will repay many times over, the scripture says, a hundred times, he said. And not just material things, but other things as well. One of the things that Terry and I have had to go through in our ministry is we've never been able to live close to our families, close to our parents. Uh, ministry has just not allowed us to do that. So in a sense, we've had to give up uh, our parents really seeing our children grow up and being real close to them. But God has always provided parents for us in every church we've been in when we needed them. As a young couple of 26, 27 years of age in our first church, there was a couple there that was, became like parents to us. They'd have us over their house. Uh, if we were there on holidays, they just took us in and made us one of their family. They had children our age, and God supplied in the first church we served in down in Florida, the same thing. In the church we went over in Atlanta, the same thing. Now, by the time we got here, we were old enough that we didn't need parents, but so God gave us brothers and sisters to hang out with, right? So he supplied much more than we ever had. Hudson Taylor, that missionary to China, one of the most famous missionaries to China back in the 1800s, his philosophy of his ministry and life was trusting God to move men by prayer alone. In other words, he believed that God would meet all of his needs and that would be done by him simply praying and asking God to touch people's hearts to give to him. That he wouldn't approach anybody, he wouldn't say, I have a need, he would just trust God to move men through prayer alone. Well, he determined, I think wisely, that if he was going to go to China and have to trust God to provide everything he needed in China, that he needed to learn to trust God in London, England the same way. 
If he couldn't trust God to provide everything he needed in London, England, he could never trust God to provide everything he needed through prayer alone in China as well. And so he committed to trust God through prayer to move people to support him. And at this point of his life, he was working for a doctor, and this doctor had agreed to pay him a certain amount ever so often, but this doctor was notorious at forgetting to pay him. But Hudson Taylor would never remind him he would just trust God to provide. On this one occasion, he talks about he was, he was preaching in some, some houses, tenant houses, and he would do this. He would go to the poor section of town, and he would preach in these tenant houses. And he said at this time, all he had was a half crown, which was equivalent to a dollar, which obviously would go further than it will now, but it still wasn't a great amount. That's all he had in his pocket. He said he had enough food to eat supper that night, a, a bowl of gruel, and enough for breakfast the next morning, but then he was out of food. Nothing else. Didn't have enough. Well, this man came up to him who was... Who was sad and upset and anguished, and he said, would you please come and pray for my wife? She is deathly sick. She's just had a baby, and she's deathly sick. And so Hudson Taylor said, of course, I'll be glad to. And as he was walking to the man's house, he noticed the man said he was Irish, and he said, well, why didn't you call the priest? He said, well, the priest wouldn't come without me paying him, and we don't have any money. So Hudson Taylor thought about that dollar he had in his pocket, and he thought, God, you know, if I just had two quarters and a, and a 50 cent piece, I'd give him 75 cents and I'd keep that quarter. But then he walked on and he kept this fight was going on within him, wrestling with this concept. And so God was saying, so you're willing to trust me with a quarter in your pocket, but you're not willing to trust me with nothing in your pocket. And so he was wrestling with all of this. He got to the man's house. He said the man had several children who were there who just looked like they were emaciated. His wife was weak and hungry and sick, and the little baby was just been born, was crying, and man, God was dealing with him on this subject. And he kept saying, God, if I only had two quarters and, and 50 cents, I'd give him 75 and just keep a quarter for myself. And God just kept dealing with him. And finally, God gave him the verse, to him that ask, give to him. And so he knew God's will was for him to give it all. So he reached down in his pocket, he pulled out that dollar, and he said, here, he said, you have it. God's told me to give it. But he said at that moment, his heart got so light and so filled with joy that on his way back to his place he was staying, he said he was singing and praising God in those desolate streets. Well, he got there. He had his little bowl of gruel for supper that night. The next morning, he was eating his last bit of food, having no idea where he was going to get any more. He had no money. As he was eating his breakfast, the landlady brought him a letter that had come in the mail, a package. He opened up that package, and inside of it, he says, was a pair of kid gloves. He reached inside one of the gloves, and there was $4 in that glove. And he said, my, wouldn't the bankers love 400% return? And one day, wouldn't the bankers love this? And God provided. A couple of weeks later, that money was all gone. He needed to pay his landlady her money. At the same time, he was running out of money for food. And the doctor owed him for several weeks' pay, but he hadn't. So he was saying, God, I'm trusting you. You're going to touch his heart. Here it was Saturday afternoon. He needed to pay the landlady on Monday. And as the doctor, right before he was leaving, he said, have I paid you lately? And Hudson Taylor said, well, no, actually, you haven't. He was getting all excited now. And the doctor said, man, just this afternoon, I took all the money to the bank. He said, if I hadn't have done that, I'd have paid you today. So Hudson Taylor said, his countenance just fell. <laughs> so the doctor left, and he just said, Lord, I'm, uh, I'm trusting you. I mean, if I can't trust you to provide in London, I can't trust you to provide in China. Well, after about an hour later, he heard the doctor approaching whistling. 
the doctor came back in. He said, the strangest thing just happened to me. He said, one of my patients, who is a very rich man, who could easily pay me by check, said God would not let him rest tonight until he came and paid me in cash what he owed me. And so I am here to pay you what I owe you. God provided what he needed because he was following Jesus as Lord. Third condition, we must give joyfully. Each one must do just as he's purposed in his heart, not grudgingly, nor under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having a sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Look at what he's saying. He says, you give joyfully, and God's going to make sure that you have enough to continue to serve joyfully. You give cheerfully, and He will always make sure you have a sufficiency in everything so that you can have an abundance to keep serving Him. Someone has said, you cannot outgive God. Now, we don't give to get back, but we give joyfully because we love Jesus. Now, do you give to God with the same amount of joy that you pay your electric bill? Now, think about that. When you write your check, to west side, to the Lord, do you have more joy in that check than you do when you pay your electric bill or you pay your water bill or you pay your utility bill? Now, I have to wrestle with this sometimes. You know, it can almost just become like, well, it's just another bill to pay. God doesn't want that. He wants us to give joyfully. He wants us to give cheerfully. We are not saying, Lord, help me. I want to give joyfully. I want to give cheerfully. I don't want to be like I'm paying a utility bill. So we need to give joyfully. Next, we need to give generously. Jesus said, given it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. For by the standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Now, the word picture Jesus gives here is this, you had a robe. In those days, they wore robes, and if they were going to get some grain or something, they would pull their robe up and kind of make a basket out of it. And then they would put stuff in that robe. Well, the picture here is that he says, give and it will be given back to you. They'll fill up that robe, press it down, push it down, and then it'll keep going until it's falling over the side. You give, and God's going to give back to you more than you ever gave. Now, in the context of this verse, it has to do with judging people, condemning people. It has to do with pardoning people. It's not just material things. He says, whatever you give, God's going to multiply back. You need more time, you need to give time to God, and He'll multiply time back in your life. You'll have more time than you realize. You see, we are to give in the area of our need. Not just the material things, but you need love, you need to give love. You need forgiveness, and you need to give forgiveness. Now, don't look to the person that you're giving it to to give back. You look to God to give it back. You might give friendship to this person over here. They might not reciprocate your friendship, but God will provide friends somewhere else for you. You're lonely? Then give yourself to somebody else to help them in their loneliness, and then God will multiply back to you, press down, Shaken together, let it all settle, and then running over. You see, we give in the area of our need. That's so counterintuitive. See, what we used to do is where we have a need, we hold on, right? God says, no, no, give at the point of your need, and then I will give back to you and meet that need. So what are the conditions we've seen so far? Give to Christian ministries. Seek God first, follow Jesus as your Lord, give joyfully, give generously, and now we come to the last one. Fear God. Psalm 34, 9. Oh, fear the Lord, you His saints. For those who fear Him, there is no want, there is no lack. Now, to fear God means to have a holy awe of God. It doesn't mean to be terrified of God, but it means to have a holy reverence for God. It means to revere Him highly. It means to have a deep 
respect for Him. The Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. What it means is you highly respect and revere God so much that you respect His Word. You respect what He says. You respect His ways over your way. You respect His will over your will. And so you submit to the authority of His Word in your life. You govern your life. You direct your life by His Word because you so dearly revere and respect Him that you accept He knows what is best. Now, I think this means that you govern your life by biblical principles of finance. God has never said that if we wastefully spend our money that He is going to meet our needs. Now, sometimes God graciously does anyway. Sometimes we are foolish, and God is under no obligation, but He, out of mercy and grace, does it. But don't count on it. God is under no obligation to bless our foolish spending or our irresponsible financial habits or practices. If I buy more house than I can afford, and I get down the road four, five, six months, and I can't make my house payment, I can't expect God to provide money for that house payment. I didn't make a wise decision when I bought that house. And have you ever noticed, have you ever been house hunting, you ever noticed the very house you want is always a little bit more? You know, it just seems. But you can't make decisions like that. I get my tax refund back. I take my family and we go to Disney World for a week. And then three months later, my house needs painting. I can't go to God and say, God, you need to meet my need to paint my house. He'll look at me and say, why didn't you use that money you went to Disney World and pay for your paint? You see what I'm saying? We've got to use sound biblical principles of finance if you're going to expect God to meet your needs. We need to be living within our means. That means not spending more than you're taking in. If you're going to expect God to meet your needs. So here we have the conditions that God has stated. Let's review them just for a moment. Give to Christian ministries. Seek God first. Follow Jesus as your Lord. Give joyfully. Give generously. And fear God, meaning use sound financial biblical principles. All right, now let's look at how you can claim this promise. Say you're experiencing an unmet need in your life today. What should you do? First, make sure it's a legitimate need and not just a want. Is this something I really need? Or can I do without this? Before God, say, God, show me, is this really a need? Secondly, examine your life. Make sure that you're fulfilling all these conditions that we talked about. Ask the Lord to show you, am I seeking you first? Have I not been responsible in my financial decisions? It may be you have foolishly purchase something that's got you in trouble and you're going to have to go and sell that thing to get you out of trouble. So you need to be honest. Am I meeting these conditions? Also, in examining yourself, God may be putting His hand of discipline in your life. God will use unmet needs to discipline us, to get us to the place that we start looking at our lives and saying, God, something's wrong here because I know you will meet my needs. So are you trying to tell me something? A man by the name of Harry Einsides, who is uh, a famous preacher in, in the uh, early 1900s in the United States, he made it a practice of, when he was younger, of just going by faith to preach. He went to Fresno, California once and just started preaching on the streets, trusting God was going to meet his needs. Well, he got to a place that he didn't have any money for food left over, had left. He didn't have any money to stay, so he had to leave the place he was staying. He had to leave his suitcase at a drugstore, and he went out and sat under a tree in the courtyard, courthouse yard of Fresno. And he said, God, what's going on? I mean, you said you would supply all my needs, and I don't, you're not doing it. 
And then God, God began to deal with him about some things in his life that were not what God wanted them to be. And so he had a revival under that tree, got his life right with God, and the next day things turned around. Friends came to him and said, hey, come and eat with us today. People said, hey, won't you come stay with us? A church he was preaching in gave him enough money to return home. And then when he got home, lo and behold, he had a letter from his dad, which he said was unexpected. And in that letter, his dad said, you know, God spoke to me through Philippians 4.19. My God will supply all your needs. You know, God really showed me that sometimes we may need a starving and he'll supply that starving. You see, sometimes what you really need is an unmet, unmet need. Because God wants to get your attention. He wants to deal with you. And so you need to examine your life and say, Okay, God, is this your hand of discipline? Are you trying to tell me something? Or maybe he's seeking to get your attention. He wants to move you in a different direction in your life. So you need to ask him about that. So examine your life. And then thirdly, claim the promise by faith and patience. By faith, believe God already has the supply before you ever have the need. Do you believe that? Well, let me ask you this question. Before man ever needed air to breathe, did God already have the air there? He did. Before you ever needed your sins forgiven, had Jesus already been crucified from the foundation of the world? He had. Before you ever needed the beautiful color of green and blue to soothe your eyes, had God already produced the green, luscious growth and the blue sky? He had. So you see, God has a supply before we even have the need. That's the faith of it. Secondly, by patience, wait on God. You see, in His time and in His way to His glory, He will meet that need but not in your time, in your way to your glory. Resist, the, resist trying to figure out how God's going to do it. That's none of your business. You just trust Him. You wait on Him. And the waiting will strengthen your faith. So once you've gone through all these other steps, and they've all cleared away, and you're still not seeing it met, then you've got to trust God's using it to strengthen your faith. Keep on trusting Him. Keep on waiting. Be patient. And then the last step, rejoice in God's supply even before you receive it. Rejoice in it before you ever receive it. That's the joy. I want to just share from personal experience. I don't have to talk about Hudson Taylor. I can speak from my own experience the truthfulness of God in this promise. And I speak of His faithfulness, not of mine, but of His. I've been in ministry now 40 years, and during that time, I have never had an unmet need that God has not supplied everything I needed. In those 40 years, there has never been a late payment on a utility bill. There's never been a late payment on a mortgage bill. There's never been a late payment on any bill that I've ever had. God has always supplied what I need. Now, I have not paid on some credit cards a couple of times because I lost a statement and, and didn't remember to pay it, but I had the money to pay it if I had remembered. God has always supplied all we need. Terry has not worked outside the home since I was in seminary. We believed it was God's place for her and wanted her to be in the home with the children. That was what was right for us. And God has honored that. I've housed, fed, clothed six children during these 40 years of ministry. And as any family, we have had our ups and downs. God has supplied for all six to graduate from college. Many times I had two in college at the same time and at one time three in college at the same time, but God provided. All six needed their wisdom teeth surgically removed. God supplied what we needed. 
Three out of the six spent time in the neonatal intensive care unit when they were born for a week or longer. God supplied what insurance didn't pay. Three of the six had surgeries. One, multiple surgeries. But God's always supplied what the insurance wouldn't pay. I can't even count the number of times we've been to the emergency room through the years. God's always supplied. Three of the six have had broken bones. God has supplied. Four of the six needed glasses and have had to have glasses and contact lens. God has provided. Four daughters have been married. And if you've ever had a daughter, you know what that is to give them a wedding. But God has provided for four to be married. Now, when Tiffany, my oldest, was 12 years old, I started putting $100 a month in a mutual fund. That covered her wedding and the second daughter's wedding. But when it came to the third and fourth daughter's wedding, which were married three weeks apart, that money was gone. But God provided. I never borrowed a single penny to pay for a wedding, to pay for college. God provided in his faithfulness. Five of the six children needed braces. But God provided. Did we have to struggle sometimes? Yes. Was it hard? Yes. At one time in my ministry, every suit I had in my closet was a dead man's suit. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, somebody died in our church, and his wife said, would you like to look through his suits and see some fit you? I'd say, yeah. And we had a lady in the church that could alter, and every suit in my closet was a dead man's suit. Terry and I didn't know any way to shop except Kmart. That was before Walmart came up. But God provided. I shop at Walmart now. I don't have any, I'm not ashamed to wear Walmart clothes. Walmart and Kohl's, those are my two places. I don't have to have brand names. God provides everything we need. Also, he's provided spiritual needs. I preached over 3,000 sermons in my 40 years, and he has never failed to give me the grace I needed to preach every sermon. Numerous times, more than I can count, I have wanted to get up and run out of the church before I preach. I've been sitting in that chair or sitting on a pew, and it's come time to preach, and everything in me was such a spiritual attack going on. I just wanted to get up and run out of the church. I wanted to do anything but preach. But God gave me the grace to get up and preach. More times than I can count over the 40 years, I have wanted to quit the ministry. I mean, I have wanted to quit it. Terry has heard me many times. I just can't take it any longer. I want to quit. I want to get out. But God's given me the grace to persevere, to hang in there, to keep going. In hundreds of counseling sessions through the years, God has given me the wisdom to be able to give counsel to people who are there. Thousands of visits in the hospital rooms. God has never failed to give me the grace to minister to people in their needs. Let me tell you, you don't have to read Hudson Taylor. You don't have to read George Mueller. But you, I can testify to you, our God is faithful. And there are many more needs that I don't have time to bring up that God's met. I mean, and... I've blown it sometimes, and he's graciously met needs. But let me tell you, our God will meet all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ. Let's pray. <clears throat> we do welcome you, and I'm glad that you have taken the opportunity to listen to a sermon on our Internet. And I want you just to know that uh, everybody in the church is not like me. Uh, I have these fellows up here, our leadership team. Uh, this is Filiberto Medina, who is our Hispanic pastor. And our Hispanic congregation meets every Sunday evening at 6.30. This is Paul Kumar. He is our minister of community connections. Uh, and to my left is Mark Baker, who heads up our Reformers Unanimous Ministry, which is a Christian addiction recovery program that meets every Friday night at 7 o'clock. So if you live in the Mableton area, uh, and it doesn't matter what 
race you're from. It doesn't matter your cultural background. I want you to know you are welcomed at Westside Church. This is where everybody is somebody and Jesus is Lord. Hope you'll join us soon. Thank you for being with us for this message. Each week, Dr. Stewart gives practical applications and ways to live out the Word of God. If you would like more information, please take a moment to view our website at wbcfamily.org. That's wbcfamily.org.